this morning. We're so excited about our brand new book and we have an incredible lineup of guest speakers from and our authors who will be joining us over the next four days as we celebrate the launch of Back Yourself, our new book. And first up today, I would love to introduce you to Rebecca Corbett. Welcome, Rebecca. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Peace. <laughs> We're so excited to be hearing from you this morning, Rebecca. So I'll let you take it away in a moment. But I, I just wanted to ask if the, if people have questions, shall we wait till the end of the presentation to ask those? Yeah, I have a slide that has a big Q&A on it. So that's probably a good spot to ask you questions. Okay, perfect. So please just make sure you jot down your questions as we go. And then we'll have a Q&A session with Rebecca at the end. All right, wonderful. Well, take it away, Rebecca. I can't wait to hear your presentation. It's nothing like being first up <laughs> early in the morning, <laughs> but thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, so my name is Rebecca Corbett and that is my face on the screen. Um, and I just want to, little side note, that picture was taken during a branding session where I'm about 20 kilos heavier than my lightest weight. And I put that branding session off for six months. And in that time frame, I put three kilos on. Um, so if you feel a little self-conscious about any weight that you've put on, just do it because I get so many comments on that picture. So without further ado, let's crack on in. Um, I need to just check that this slide has, oh, there we go. Now it's working. So who am I and why am I sitting here talking to you today? So I have 15 years experience, a little more now um, in the business and finance world. So I am 34 and I've been working in finance with my family's businesses since I was quite young. And um, after school, I went to university and started a Bachelor of Business. And about two years in, I was bored as hell and quit. Um, <laughs> I've done a few other diplomas along the way, um, but you definitely don't need to have a university education to run a business, that is for certain. I left the corporate world of the Sunshine Coast um, in 2008 and I moved to Bundaberg where I had no friends, no family, just me and my boyfriend at the time. Spoiler alert, we get married, have two kids and divorce. You'll read all about it in the book. Um, and I've been in business for the better part of the last decade for myself. I've had a few contracts along the way that were employee contracts, but for the most part, I have been responsible for my own wage, putting food on the table as a single mom, which is bloody stressful. Um, so I built uh, one of my, I call it my, I call it my first business, but I did family daycare prior. So my first business, Tally and Tick, um, it was a bookkeeping firm and I built it from the ground up. I grew it. I regrew it three times. Again, you'll read that in the book because I nearly lost it three times. And I eventually sold it for enough profit to get myself out of the debt that I was in from my divorce. All I took from my divorce was the dog and the debt. Um, and so now uh, I am a business specialist. Um, mostly I concentrate on um, strategic planning um, and zero training. Zero is just something that is ingrained in my brain. Finances is something that clicks. Much to the dismay of my accounting teacher at high school, I never became an accountant, um, but I have that financial knowledge and I love seeing people have that aha moment when the numbers just line up and they see exactly that they have been making profit or where they're losing their money. So that's enough about me. Um, I am going to be talking to you today about resilience. And my chapter in the book is called Resilience Through Personal Crisis. Um, I will touch on a little bit of that story today, but I want to leave enough for you to enjoy in the book. So earlier this year, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship for a resilient leadership course here in town in Bundaberg, where I am in Queensland. And it was such good timing. At that point, COVID hadn't hit when I had applied for the scholarship. And I actually left a very lucrative employee contract two weeks before COVID hit, planning to go back into my business with all the plans in the world to make it succeed. And then COVID came along and everything changed. And I am so thankful that I attended this Resilient Leadership course. We had one session in person. It was supposed to be four days, one person, one in-person session. And then we went online and we had to have hour long sessions multiple times a week, which was rather painful, but still so valuable. And it taught me 
so much about myself. I have changed so much in my business um, and, and it's only been for the better. But there are six domains of resilience um, and you can see those on the screen. Your vision, your composure, your reasoning, collaboration, tenacity, and your health. So I'm going to talk about each of these domains today and what that means for business. So the first of all is your vision. And this is the most important of the domains. The vision is about your sense of purpose, your goals, and your personal vision for yourself. The reason that this is the most important domain is that all the other domains are guided by what it is that you want to achieve. So having clarity in your vision allows you to be decisive when facing some really tough choices. It's kind of like putting the blinkers on a horse so that they're not distracted. It's important to keep your goals specific, clear, and attainable. Clarity helps keep you focused. It's easy to get distracted by unimportant details. And if you have nothing planned in your day, then you might find yourself binge watching the new season of The Crown. Guilty. Um, but vision is about having clarity so that when things get tough, you know what's important and what isn't in order to stay focused and achieve your goals. Having a base list of tasks that must be done to keep your business running it can help you keep that focus, particularly when faced with a crisis. It's really hard to find a balance between a work and personal life. When I was going through my divorce and I nearly lost my business, I had to make a really conscious effort that I spent equal time on both situations. I desperately wanted to curl up in a ball and do nothing, but my kids deserved better from me. I was kind to myself on the days that I really needed to rest and rest I did but that only lasted about a day. And the next day I made sure to tick off the minimum business tasks that I needed to, so that my business could survive in that minor holding pattern whilst I got everything else back together. Congruence um, is all of your actions working together. So across your larger vision of yourself, your sense of purpose and through your medium and your short-term goals, when you don't have clarity on these, it's likely that some of your goals may conflict with each other. And this can result in um, your actions, in frustration as moving towards one goal moves you further away from another. So instead of your actions being aligned, everything you do slowly moves you towards your um, ultimate goals. So helping you achieve the things that everybody else deemed impossible. It's important too for your business actions to align with your personal ones. When I started Tally and Tick, I did it for freedom and flexibility around my children. And so many mums tell me that. And very, very quickly, uh, my work snowballed where I was doing 60, 70 hours a week and I wasn't seeing my kids and they were at um, after school care, which is the whole reason why I started a business was to not send them there. And so my business goals were no longer aligned with my personal goals and they were really in conflict with each other. I really lost my vision and I lost my why. And that was ultimately the demise of me. It wasn't the demise of my business. It was the demise of me because I put myself last. So having that really clear vision, those really clear goals, when things come up, you can really assess is this going to get me closer to my goals? Is this aligned with my vision? So the second domain of resilience is composure. Um, so this is all about regulating your emotions. So the fight or flight response of the brain, it really loves to flare up when you're facing conflict um, or hearing about a sudden change, especially if you're change averse. But being able to overcome that instinctive emotional response and maintain your composure means that you will be able to recognize the hidden opportunities and solve your problems in really creative ways. Becoming emotional can prevent you from assessing your ability to think critically. And as females, we're on the back foot with this because we're such emotional beings. And I think this is why historically men are seen as better at business because they often can leave the emotion out of it. Um, more so than a female. 
but it's also the little things. So composure is not just about the big crises that we face, but also the little everyday things. So I have terrible road rage. I I race at Speedway. So I have terrible, terrible road rage. Um, And if I get stuck in traffic and it makes me late, I get so angry. And that just permeates into the rest of my day, which is just not kind to anybody. (laughs) Um, But it's also not kind to me and it's not conducive to business. The other thing is your interpretation bias. So if your boss, if you had one, but you could be the boss, walks up to you and says, I need to talk to you, come and see me later. It's that panic that you get because you're worrying that you're going to be in trouble for something. Um, But it could just be good news. And that interpretation bias that you have of the things that people are saying to you is such a hindrance in being able to keep your composure. Taking a breath, asking for clarity on things that are being said and gaining more information is often the key to keeping your emotions in check and keeping all of that yucky trouble between people at bay. Top tip, works with your husband too. (laughs) Um, But you also need to be really proactive. So composure is not just about being able to return to a state of poise, but also about considering your own beliefs and expectations that produce emotions in the first place. So for example, if you expect that nothing will ever go wrong with your project, then you're likely to be in for a really big shock. Nothing ever goes right in business the way that you planned. I shouldn't say it never goes right. It just doesn't go the way that you planned, but it always ends up being the right thing in the end. Um, But being prepared for that um, and knowing that things may go wrong and being able to maintain your composure during that time and to be able to think critically is really that key to success in your business. So the third domain is reasoning. And so reasoning is all about creative problem solving. It's incredibly useful when you are facing challenges and that's what the reasoning domain is all about. This domain needs composure for you to keep your cool as well as your vision so that you know what goals to direct your actions toward. When you're faced with a problem, you may not see the solution immediately, but can I encourage you to take a breath, think through all the possibilities that there are, no matter how silly or unachievable that they may seem, and try talking them over out loud with a friend that is often the quickest road to a solution. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've been on the phone to my best friend who is so supportive of my business and we'll just be talking about something and she's very creative and I'm very logical and she will come up with these, what I call pie in the sky ideas, but we flesh them out and go, well, how could they actually work? And oftentimes she's right because she's just bringing a different perspective. To um, your reasoning is also about anticipating and planning. So like composure, it's not just about applying critical thinking during a crisis, but also about taking action ahead of time to prevent things going from going wrong in the first place. In fact, it's mostly about proactive action. So think proactively through things that may go wrong and take action ahead of time to prevent or minimize their impact. So this could look like documenting your processes and procedures along the way so that a VA or a PA could step in and take over your business tasks really easily when you're faced with a crisis. Or it could be implementing technology to automate your business so so that you have time to do the other things um, in your life. So what does that look like? It might be an online calendar where people can book in for themselves and pay for your consultation ahead of time. It then sends out email and text reminders to them so that when you're faced with a crisis, you're not having to keep up with all of that stuff. You just have to turn up at the time of your consult and function as a human being for an hour. But the best part is that when we plan for a crisis, the solutions that we implement may actually mean that we have a reduced workload in normal everyday times, which is a massive win-win for me. So we're prepared for the crisis, but we're also reducing our workload and probably increasing our profits. You also need to be resourceful. So having the right information, tools, techniques, 
and the people available around you to help solve these problems more effectively and find more efficient ways to reach your goals. So resourcefulness is a skill that we need to actively build. It's generally not something that we're born with. The more resourceful that we are, the easier it becomes to make those connections and find innovative ways forward. So reach out to those around you and get their input, even from those in another industry. And I want to give you a story here. When I started as a business specialist, I started a mastermind and I had a gym owner, which think of it like a laundromat. It's a hole in the wall gym. You scan in, scan out. And he was looking at ways to innovate his gym. He is in a tiny, tiny town. It's called Jin Jin. It's just out of Bundaberg. There's like handfuls of people that are in this town. So clients are not easy to come across. And there was a pest control person also in this mastermind. And we were doing an activity where we brainstormed each other's businesses for five minutes each. And you couldn't say no to anything. You couldn't argue against anything. You just had to listen to the solutions, write them down and then go away and see if you could implement them. And the pest control guy being the cheeky person that he is said, why don't you offer like bottle service like they do in the nightclubs where the, you know, the girls walk around with the bottles and the fireworks and they do bottle service to the VIP tables. Why don't you do bottle service um, of like protein shakes? And we just cracked up laughing. But you know what? That gym owner went away and he actually came up with a VIP membership. He didn't have bikini clad girls walking around with protein shakes, but what he had was a special VIP membership where you got extra one-on-one help. You got a text message from one of the team every morning encouraging you. If you were going to um, break and eat a Mars bar, you could text them and say, I really want to eat a Mars bar. And someone would jump on and text back with you. Um, And they put together food and things like that. So um, it was amazing hearing this person from another industry come up with this somewhat silly idea and it actually working. And I want you to see the opportunity in change. So a high reasoning ability means that a changing environment is a welcome environment since it always brings these hidden opportunities. So by maintaining your composure and knowing what you want to achieve, change is no longer a threat and you can look for things that others might have missed. Change can be really hard and I know this quite intimately after going through my divorce. And right now, as I sit here talking to you, After four years of being with my current partner, I'm going through a separation with him and I'm sitting in a house that's not even going to be mine in two weeks. And I'm faced with that change again. But I know that there is opportunity in that change. I've put on 15 odd kilos from my lightest weight in the time that we've been together. And I'm really looking forward to being able to set my own working hours again being able to take the time out in the day to go for a beach trip and have that time out in the morning and make up for that in the evening when I'm actually most firing with my brain and not having to have somebody complaining that I'm always working. There is always a silver lining in every situation. And while it will be hard and it is quite emotionally draining, always look for those golden opportunities in your change. The fourth domain of resilience is tenacity. And this is something that I seem to have in spades. Every time that I do a feedback form, everyone uses the word tenacious. And I do often come across as that. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's a mask Um, and sometimes it's genuine, um, but it is just the way that I am. So with tenacity, persistence is the key. So Einstein very famously pointed out that the importance of persistence for success when he said that it's not that I'm so smart, it is just that I stay with problems longer. So I'll say that again. It is not that I am so smart. It is just that I stay with my problems longer. So in a globalized world, success is no longer a given. We are competing online against so much noise and we need to be willing to work hard and smart and stay with a problem if we hope to achieve something, especially if you want to achieve something that nobody else has. We also need to remember that there are no mistakes, only lessons. Rarely will we do things right the very first time. And even when doing something we know well, eventually we will make mistakes. 
So at home, with friends, in our business, mistakes can creep in everywhere. And what is so important is how we react to those mistakes. So admonishing yourself is not going to help. Instead, it's really important to objectively look at your mistakes, find the lessons in them, and not define yourself by them. The past is there to learn from, not to dwell on. I made every mistake in the book. When I started my bookkeeping business, I set my rate too low. I entered the phone out of hours. I piled so much work on myself in the pursuit of success. And I made myself very, very sick. These were all lessons, not mistakes. And they're lessons that I now pass on to my clients. I've lived that experience and I know exactly how they feel. And if anything, they have benefited me. In your tenacity, don't be naive, but have some realistic optimism. So research shows that people who are overly optimistic about succeeding are less likely to, since they tend to give up at the first sign of trouble. What is more useful for success is to have a sense of realistic optimism. So meaning that you are hopeful about your ability to succeed, but you realize that the road can be tough and full of challenges. That realization combined with the willingness to be persistent is what ultimately leads to success for individuals in business. It's great to have goals and dreams that stretch us beyond our capabilities, but being realistic on our expectations of ourselves is the key. So all those overnight successes that you see are often decades in the making. And those entrepreneurs with the hashtag laptop lifestyle pictures on Instagram are probably spending a ton of money on VAs and staff in exchange for them doing very little work. So don't let the glitz of Instagram sway your expectations of yourself. The fifth domain of resilience is collaboration. And this one is a huge one for the Osmompreneur Network. If you don't feel like you're great at collaboration, jump on into the Osmompreneur Network and the groups and the events because there is collaboration in spades. So we are really social beings and the brain has this deep fundamental need for connection with others to be able to thrive. The brain has a dedicated neural structure to recognize facial expressions, while mirror neurons fire within the brain to help us empathize with others. We are, after all, in this together. So what we do and focus on is not just for us, but about our communities together and improving our world. This connection is what, collab is what the collaboration domain is about. When I started Tally and Tick, I tried local networking events and I faced a fair chunk of negativity from some people. And so I retreated and I kept to myself and it was a really lonely existence. I tried some online business forums, but some of them can just be plain awful. And I'm so thankful that I found the Osmopreneur Network. Their group is supportive. It's caring. I'm able to fill my social cup with other women online in a supporting, caring, but most importantly, giving environment. So with collaboration, you want to support as well as be supported. So in a complex world, few of us can achieve anything meaningful alone. So it's crucial for us to build support networks so we can both have a safety net and also be that safety net for others. Interestingly, research shows that when it comes to peace of mind, it's not actually the available support that matters, but instead it's the perception of the available support. Um, so if you have 100 people ready to support you and you don't realise this, then you will not feel supported. Keep this in mind for others as well. Knowing this is crucial. If you can show other people that you care and that you're there to support them whenever they need you, they're going to feel more supported. And you learn so much about yourself and your skills when you help other people. You also want to get the context right when you are collaborating. So a key part of collaboration is understanding the context of your interaction with people. So when you have a meeting with people in your business or you're spending time with your friends on the weekend, they are two very different contexts. 
For example, in your business, it's more important to focus on facts than emotion and keep things professional and not take anything too personally. At home, it's not always about the facts and very important to address emotions as it's a vital part of maintaining healthy relationships. This can be really, really difficult for business owners when they bring their factual self home from the business or their emotional self into the business. It's usually one or the other. And it can be really challenging to the opposite um, relationships that you have with people. I see this really often with um, businesses in some groups online where business owners are bringing too much emotion into business decisions, especially when they are confronted with a difficult customer. They let their emotions sway their response. But the fact is that our customer is not attacking us personally. It's just business. While they don't have to be unkind, it's just business. Try to remove your lens of emotion when you're making your business decisions and remember that it is not an attack on you personally. The sixth and final domain of resilience is health. So this is the foundational domain. Good health means looking after your body through what you eat, doing exercise and getting quality sleep. So think about that. What have you eaten in the last 24 hours? How much exercise have you done in the last week? And did you get a good night's sleep last night? A healthy body provides you a strong foundation for your own resilience so that you can focus on your sense of purpose and your goals. Good health is not the ultimate goal itself, but instead that's the enabler and the gateway for you to achieve your larger vision. So healthy nutrition, it's not about keeping lean. And I gave up the whole 15 kilo thing a while ago. It's just a marker that I use. I just want to be healthy. I don't care how heavy I am. But nutrition affects your brain health and your mental performance. So if you regularly eat foods that are high in fats and sugars, so chocolate, ice cream, biscuits, takeaway, actually reduces the chemical in your brain that produces more brain cells. And this will reduce your mental adaptability. So you really want to nourish your brain with good nutrition so that you can be firing on all cylinders. So when I had an employee contract last year, I was driving a really long distance between towns. It took me four and a half hours to get from one side of my area to the other in the locations that I covered. And so I found myself going through a lot of drive throughs getting takeaway that I could eat while I was driving because I didn't have the time to stop and eat lunch, which is ridiculous. Um, I did. (laughs) It really wasn't optimal for my body, especially with the hours that I was putting in to be able to drive that far in a day. So pre-planning your food can really help you. So I started keeping protein bars in my bag So that if I was hungry and on the road, I could just snack on that instead. I scoped out all the supermarkets in the towns that I worked in and I found the ones that had single serving containers of nuts, pre-cut up veggie sticks. Some even had homemade salad wraps. So knowing where I could go in each town for healthy food that I could eat on the run helped keep me out of the drive-thru. Quality sleep. So lack of sleep results in way more mistakes. You have a reduced attention span and a decreased ability to deal with stress. It also increases the cortisol, which is your brain's stress hormone. And the effect of that adds up over time. And that compounding toll on your body, your brain and your performance, it's it's awful. Sleep makes a big difference, but it's not about the quantity. It's about getting enough quality sleep. Sleep deprivation is a torture tool. So why would we want to inflict upon ourselves a torture tool? That's really not fair on ourselves. It's becoming almost a badge of honor in the entrepreneurial world to survive on as little sleep as possible. And that culture, quite frankly, it needs to stop. It's dangerous and it's not a competition on who can sleep the least. The lack of sleep, the increased stress, the increased cortisol, it causes adrenal fatigue. So we need to be really mindful of that. 
You also want to uh, have some regular exercise. So it's not just about being fit. Your regular exercise is proven to increase your mental performance and increase your ability to learn. So it also protects us against neurodegenerative diseases in the long term. And I quite frankly would like to be working in my business till I'm older and gray. So if you are happy with your body, exercise is still crucial. This doesn't have to be a hard slog at the gym. It can be a 30 minute walk with your kids. I know how hard it is to fit exercise into our day when we have kids. Um, being a single mom, it's really hard for me to get to a yoga class and yoga is the thing that does the, the biggest benefit for me. So instead of making excuses, I downloaded 15 minute videos from YouTube and I kept them saved on a USB stick that I could whack into my TV because I didn't have a Chromecast then. And I got yoga mats for my kids and I invited them to join me. 15 minutes is enough for them to keep their attention span and they love it. And me doing three 15 minute sessions a week is better than doing no 15 minute sessions a week. And I found that when I did those 15 minute sessions at home, although I'm an all or nothing person. So for me to do 15 minutes feels like I'm doing nothing. So this is a struggle for me, but when I do them, I keep up this momentum and I'm more likely to not make excuses and find a way to be able to get to that hour long class at least once a fortnight. It's just about forming some good habits. Above all else, you really need to put your, um, don't put your business ahead of your health. So the first time around, I caused myself adrenal fatigue and I'm still fighting that now years later. It takes us three times as long to recover from adrenal fatigue than it does to cause it. So I think I've got about another eight or nine years of recovery. You would think that that would have been enough for me to learn to take care of myself. But last year I was actually raced to hospital um, and received emergency surgery to remove my gallbladder. I had a massive gallstone that was blocking my gallbladder and had caused infection that had moved not only from the inside of the gallbladder, but to the outside of the gallbladder. And the doctors and the nurses were looking at me and saying, how are you walking? And my response was, I have shit to do. <laughs> I'd been in pain for weeks and ignoring it. And the day that I had surgery, I actually went to work because I didn't want to let down the group of ladies that I'd been working with. I was yellow, completely yellow. And I wasn't functioning mentally and I was no good to anyone. So going to work really didn't give those ladies the best of me. It's so important to put your health and yourself ahead of your business. There will be times when you will tell yourself, it's okay, I will work extra hours this week because I have this, I have a launch, I have an extra client, I have to get this done. And it is okay in the short term, but please put an end date on that and make sure that after that end date that you push the pendulum back the other way and take back that extra time for yourself. So I'm going to show you now, we're not going to complete this exercise together right now, but we're going to talk about what is your resilience score. So in the comments um, on the Zoom, there is a link. I'm hoping that you can see this screen. If you can't, just shout out at me and I'll see if I can fix it. Uh, but this is the exact personal resilience score that um, I did during my resilient leadership course. So you're going to score yourself between one and five on all three dot points in each um, section or domain. But there is a note here that you must use the full range of scores from one through to five in the overall survey. So that means that you can't go giving yourself a five for all of them. There has to be at least one, 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 two, one, three, and one, four, and one, five in this. So add up your scores and have a look. Think about these six domains like a wheel. If you were to plot these on a wheel, would one be bigger than the other? And if it is, your wheel's not going to turn really smoothly. Once you go through that page, you have um, a personal resilience growth plan. Now you're going to do this by yourself. No one is going to see this. For sure, share with somebody if you feel led. But get really honest with yourself 
and have a look at these six domains and decide what skills and behaviours that you want to develop to improve your resilience score. It's a really tough exercise. Trust me, I did it. And oh, I redo it probably every three to six months now. It was such a valuable tool. So I'm going to stop talking um, and let you ask some questions. I know we had some things come up in the chat and I deliberately ignored them so that I didn't go off on tangents. So I'll check them now or Peace or Katie might be able to call them out at me. But hit me with it. That was amazing, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, would we? Would you, you mind just stop sharing the screen so we can see everybody? Absolutely. And see all your beautiful faces. Hey, everyone! Give us a wave. <laughs> Hi. So, who has questions for Rebecca? If you turn your camera on, I would love to see you, and you can ask your question. Um, on screen. So Anne's just turned her camera on. Hi, Anne. Have you got a question or comment for Rebecca? Um, at the moment, I'm just like, yeah, the whole gallbladder thing. I've actually just gone through that. Mm. And I'm suffering now eight weeks later. Oh. Um. <laughs> right, so I'm 12 months in and I still can't eat roast pork without needing a bathroom really quickly after. I can't sleep on my left without waking up with the the burps, the 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 disgusting burps that come with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's it's amazing. And sorry, it's a bit gross for everyone else. They actually inject gas into your body and your whole stomach blows up, probably the size that you're pregnant. I don't know. I was asleep, thank goodness. <laughs> and it was so funny because my skin on my belly is now sagging and not coming back because after pregnancy, your body has all these lovely chemicals that makes everything suck back in. But after that surgery, your brain doesn't get the memo. And so the skin is just like, oh, it's all these things you don't think about. It's just gallbladder surgery, but you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> but I mean, I'm only, I'm 42 and I'd never heard of the, um, the five, the five F's for females. And it's like, oh, wow. Because I was building a deck. So I took my back pain as being from poor posture building the deck. Um, but what I was going to say is that actually gave me the time to focus on starting my business. Oh, because lovely. I <laughs> yeah, I thought my pain, because it's in your back, it's in the lower middle, like bra strap area of your back. Yeah. I actually thought I got hit by a car in 2016 and it damaged my shoulder. And I just thought it was pain in my spine from that accident and that I was you know hadn't been to the chiropractor in a while so I just kept putting it off putting it off Thought, oh it's a bit lower than usual but it'll be okay no yeah. <laughs> no definitely not um I felt I cooked dinner for my husband um because it was actually his birthday that I ended up being rushed to emergency oh. <laughs> so, and my 10 year old thought that she jinxed me because he asked for a dish we've never had before which was green banana chicken curry which is an African dish and so I, she thought green bananas would make her sick. And she made the joke that, oh, we'll be sick in the bathroom after. She woke up the next day and I was in hospital. Bless her. <laughs> but yeah, it did. It gave me the time to really think about what I want to do and how I'm going to achieve that. And I started the process of getting my business and get starting my company. So amazing uh, now the process is actually relocating back to newcastle because the company is based going to be based in newcastle but we're still living in victoria <laughs> are you allowed out yet <laughs> i think gladys has announced when we can come to queensland too because my husband missed out on a job in cairns because we couldn't get to queensland i'm pretty sure today yeah I today think so. yeah, yeah first of but yeah, we were hanging for entrance back to New South Wales, which was last week. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah it, it, it'll be good. So hopefully my, my goal and my plans all work out. I've already got my first employee. So, and I got my compliance confirmation from the Office of Children's Guardian yesterday. So wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah, Congratulations. If I hadn't fallen sick and needed the surgery in the recovery period, I probably would still just be plodding along. <laughs> but it gave me the time to reevaluate and go, yep, this is what I really want to do. Silver linings in the change. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. So Rebecca, I have a question for you. Um, I, there was so much content in that. I really enjoyed the presentation. 
Um, but I loved when you were talking about in the composure section, you talked about masculine and feminine and yeah. being too emotional and yeah, all those kind of things. And it's interesting because I've been noticing your Instagram posts come <laughs> up and even, you know, through this process of writing the book and we're, we're all getting the pink t-shirts and getting our nails done pink. <laughs> being in the feminine is not something that always <laughs> naturally to you. You've kind no. of pushed that aside to be seen as, I don't know, more professional or to fit in in a man's world. Do you want to just talk us through those kind of things? Yeah. So I think it started in high school, the third day of grade eight, so third day of high school. Um, this group of girls that I'd made friends with decided that they didn't want to be my friend anymore. <laughs> Oh, I hate high school. And I ended up in a group with a lot of boys and teenage boys are just, they're something. Um, and to, to fit in with that, I was quite masculine. I enjoy riding dirt bikes. So I've, you know, not as many females ride dirt bikes. So you always end up with the boys. I worked in a lot of male dominated places. So I was a service advisor at Holden, um, which was interesting having people speak to you and speaking to you like you're dumb when you know my dad taught me how to fix my own car I service my own cars so and I race at speedway <laughs> so masculine is very easy for me and I didn't have a very feminine mother and I didn't know how to put on makeup I've come a long way um but going into the business world especially 15 years ago even 10 years ago even five years ago so many of the organizations were men and they were older generation men. And I don't want to be stereotypical because some of the older generation men are so lovely, but it is an unfortunate um, hazard of their generation that the women stay at home and cook and the man goes to work. So being young, female, <laughs> um, it was uncomfortable. And I had my uniform. So it was my black power dress and my high heels because I'm not that tall. So it would give me a little bit of height. And I practiced my firm handshake. Um, and I always came across as very professional, very proper, um, didn't mention my children, um, just to compete and to get a seat at the table. And that's been my default for so long. And I haven't had a lot of females around me. And so being with 27 other ladies who saw the book cover and their response was, yay, pink. <laughs> and I went, ah, pink. <laughs> um, was so interesting, the feelings that it created inside me and reading the, the bios of the other ladies um, and writing my chapter knowing that I was writing it for a female and what I wanted her to know was just, um, it was so emotional um, and has just brought me to this place of, it's okay to be feminine. I'm now wearing pink, um, <laughs> I have pink lipstick on for goodness sakes. And I'm okay with it now. I'm a very strong female, but that doesn't mean that I have to be masculine. Yeah always evolving and learning. It's been a, it's been an interesting one. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. It sounds like this journey from being part of the book has just really kind of opened up new perspectives for you and, and a new, a new side of yourself that you're discovering and exploring and, and bringing forward now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is just at the same time as going through another separation and having a seven and 10 year old and what do I want for their life? And what do I want in my life? And do I want a male, in, not right now, but do I want a male in my life? And what does that look like? And what do I actually want for me and my life? Um, on a personal note, I haven't been single since I was 17 and moved out of home. Um, so I've never actually been me. I've been someone's partner or someone's wife or someone's mom. And this year I took away my trading name. So I had Talion Tick as my trading name when I had a bookkeeping firm. 
Um, when I went into being a business specialist, I called myself the healthy entrepreneur, which is a little confusing for people because I wasn't teaching nutrition. Um, and this year I took it away and I just trade under my name because there is no other me in this world. There is no one else with the experience that I have had in the way that I have had. Um, there is no one else that thinks the way that I think we are all unique and just being me is uncomfortable, but so powerful. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love that you're, you're standing strong in your name as your business and you know, you've written, you're part of this book, it's called Back Yourself. It sounds like that's exactly where you are in your life right now. Oh yeah. And I'm so glad that I'm trading underneath my maiden name. When I got married, I was like, do I have to change my name? Well, I just want to keep mine. <laughs> Didn't go down well with the ex-husband. And so now it doesn't matter if I get married and I take that person's name, I will always trade underneath Rebecca Corbett. I have an amazing history of females that were Corbett's and um, unfortunately, they've all passed now. But my Nana was the biggest supporter of me. I could call her at any moment and give her some amazing news or talk to her about business. And she'd just sit and listen. And then at the end, she'd go, oh, love, I have no idea what half the things are that you just said, but I'm sure you're going to be great at it. And she was so fiercely independent for someone of her era she was a great example so I want to I want to keep that name and keep that name alive yeah 100 percent oh so cool who else has a question for Rebecca crickets <laughs> here's Louise hi hello. Louise hello lovelies oh, wow. hello. You, you don't even have to say too much because you're glowing and projecting the energy that's coming from you congratulations Rebecca oh thank you that's um, really nice because yesterday I was a bucket of tears and a mess so <laughs> you know what I say fake it till you make it baby <laughs> <laughs> but um did you keep shooting yourself down having your self-doubt along the way or was it just like bang <clears throat> or then it kept creeping up and getting you again so I'll let you in on a little secret. My confidence and my um, loudness and my tenacity and that confidence that you see is a facade. <laughs> because inside I am, excuse my French, shitting myself all the time. Um, I am my own harshest critic. Um, I almost didn't join the book because why would I have anything to say? Um, mm. I nearly didn't quit my employee contract to come back to my business because why would anybody pay me to do what I do? Mm. I get this all the time, but the difference is that I don't let it cripple me. And I just sort of, to hell with that, I'm going to do it anyway. But the key is that I'm pretty stubborn. So I don't want to admit defeat. <laughs> so I'll yeah. just keep going. <laughs> No, we're all our own judge and executioners, but you do the fake it till you make it really well. And hopefully the scales will constantly keep like that side, piss that other side off, you know. It's beautiful people <laughs> like you, Louise, that say such lovely things. When I left my employee contract, so I was in a government funded program, so small businesses could come to me for free, um, which brings with it its own troubles. But when I finished, there were so many ladies, there were so many ladies that emailed me when I sent them through to say that I'm, I'm finishing up to say, you have helped me do this. And in the last year that I've worked with you, I have achieved X and gave me all of this wonderful stuff. And hearing that is what keeps me going. And so I guess keep being that beautiful person, Louise, mm. and holding everybody mm. up, but make sure that you have people that hold you up because it's the it that is the antidote to that self sabotage is hearing somebody else say, "No, you can." Hundred <laughs> percent. I think you nailed it just there because when we help other people, like we all are doing that, that's when we truly shine. And yeah. 
And I would say you've qualified as a lighthouse woman now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because you're constantly shining, true and strong. So many ships crashing at your shore now, looking for your guidance. So yeah. congratulations, lighthouse woman. Thank you. So beautiful, Louise. <laughs> So, do we have any other questions for Rebecca before we wrap up? Davina, how about you? You're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a delightful journey so far with you and um, I look forward to meeting you in person. Obviously, <laughs> this year's um, put, put a, a bit of a stay to all that. Mm. Um, but, yeah, how uh, I think coming from also a male-dominated industry, um, it's there's, there's constant sort of... Um, unconscious bias that goes on that we really need to sort of speak up about and I think you're on that that sort of journey and I think that's that's amazing and I look forward to, to staying on it with you where we can sort of highlight um, those things that that just don't get said mm. so thank you for being a, a voice there and, and a beacon of light as the way said to everyone um, yeah Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's sometimes it can be very draining when when you lead from the front and when you are such a loud voice. Um, and possibly one of my good things and my downfalls is that I will stand up for the underdog at the detriment of myself <laughs> um, and I will never stop fighting um, for equality. Um, for females in any industry. I, in grade six, I want to say, there was this campaign and I can't remember who was behind it. I'll have to, I'll, I'll find the sticker. So I got given a sticker that said girls can do anything. And I remember these ladies, I can't remember their names, but I remember their faces coming into school and sitting down in our class with the boys as well, telling us that girls can do anything. And I was like, yeah, we can. And I've, not stopped sprouting that from the rooftops since and it's so funny because I remember this sticker distinctly and then last year I met some beautiful ladies from the Zonta Club and they bought me um, uh, a package to ask if I would be a speaker at their um, their um, their full day event and the beautiful lady had put a sticker on the package and it was the girls can do anything sticker <laughs> and I was like oh my god this sticker is like my life and so um, I have a 10 year old daughter and a seven year old son and um, the amount of times that I've heard people say to my daughter um, oh no you won't be able to race at Speedway because you're a girl like hell She'll be racing if she wants to race. If she doesn't want to and she wants to be girly, she can be girly, but she can do anything. Or the, um, why are you wearing that? That's a boy's thing. Excuse me? I am so loud about it, but I don't want my daughter to face the, the sexual harassment that I faced in the workplace. I don't want that for her. And the harder I fight, the easier it is for her and the less that she has to fight for that. So I, I will be that old lady on a soapbox, <laughs> still banging on about feminism and equality. <laughs> well, I still think we've got a long way to go. So I think that's going to be necessary. <laughs> yeah. If I yeah. may, um, it's okay because generations eventually move on and I am seeing better from our generation but the the next generation down the the young adolescents I um I've had a little bit to do with them I did youth work for a little while um any time that I get a chance to I will volunteer in high schools and the the way that I see those adolescent boys behave with girls and I'm seeing this shift the girls are loud and they're in charge and the boys are just like 
yes, ma'am, um, which is not what we want, obviously, but mm-hmm. it there is a change and it is coming and it is coming. It'll take its time, but I think when it arrives, we are just going to go, yes, finally. Yeah. Rebecca, do you sing karaoke? <laughs> Maybe. Because there's a song for you. Oh, God. <laughs> Ready? I am woman. That's your song. <laughs> what May is, what... I have been known to sing that one after a few tequilas, Louise. <laughs> All right. Well, keep singing that, babe. <laughs> oh, amazing. Do we have any other questions? There's something that you were talking about in your um, in your presentation, which I just loved was when you were talking about collaboration mm. and it's just, and you were talking about how beautiful this community is. Mm. Can you tell us about some of the examples of collaborations that you've done and, and how it's worked? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example because <laughs> there's a few collaborations that have not worked. Um, well, on that you know then. What? Actually, the collaboration with the woman that I sold my business to is an amazing one. So mm-hmm. when I um, I was coaching as well as running my business and I had staff that was doing the bookkeeping and I really wasn't involved in it. And I had gained the full-time contract for the year after and my, one of my employees got really sick. And I had this moment of what happens if they quit or get really sick and I'm working full time and I'm no longer able to just stop my consults and jump in and do the bookkeeping, is it time to sell? And that was when I decided to sell. And I spoke to the manager of our local business enterprise center and sort of said, I think I'm going to sell, but I don't want to sell to a competition and I want my clients to be taken care of. Um, they were friends at that point after so many years. And he was like, that generally doesn't happen when you sell a business. It's like, well, I'm going to do that. So whatever. And within a week, I met this lady who had just started on her journey in bookkeeping. Um, She had left a really awful um, male dominated, disgusting employee position. And I spoke to her and we came to an agreement and she actually came and worked for me for three months in that handover um and so rather than her saying no I know everything I just want to buy your business she said what can I learn from you in the next three months and I said what do you need to learn rather than me tell her what I thought she needed to know and we worked together side by side for three months um she got the wonderful job of working over Christmas and I had the first Christmas off that I'd had in six years it was bloody awesome um and then come Jan end of January the sale was finalized and off she went. And I very purposefully um, stayed out of the business after that and and stayed away, even though I knew that I could give her some advice along the way. And a couple of months later, she came to me and said, I want you to be my coach and I want you to help me. And so we worked together for six months. So really um, not common, but I would go out on a limb and say that would never have happened if I sold to a man. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. And now we've got, we've got two minutes left, but I do want to ask you, because this is one of my favorite topics. What do you think is the difference between a collaboration that works really well and one that doesn't work well? I think the thing to remember is you may be an expert in your field, but they are an expert in their field. And especially with me being a very loud and dominating person, I often forget to allow other people to speak. And the collaborations that work the best are when you use your two ears to listen and close the one mouth that you have, because we have twice as much listening capacity. And just because you may know the answer doesn't mean that you need to say it. Um, Being in the resilient leadership uh, course earlier this year, you're obviously around 15 other leaders. So 15 other D types on the disc scale um, and all of us wanting to have our say. And I challenged myself to not be the first person to speak up as soon as the person had stopped presenting and and had questions, which is difficult for me 
so <laughs> difficult. And I just, I just was. And everybody else had so many, many valuable things to say. My idea was brought out in other people's, um, you know, ideas. So in collaboration, remember to listen, know your place of what part is yours, um, but remember to listen. Beautiful. I love that. And I think that's so true for, for any kind of relationship that you have. The listening is important. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Collaborations. Collaborations.